In this video, we are going to cover C-style arrays, also sometimes called square bracket arrays. I generally recommend students don't use C-style arrays and that they use vector from the standard library instead. However, in the beginning of this course, we are going to be looking at how the vector class itself can be implemented. And for this, we need to know about C-style arrays in order to implement vector. So we're going to use C-style arrays to implement a toy version of vector. But after we understand how vector works under the hood, then, we're just, then we can just use vector as our default container for the rest of the course. And we won't really use C-style arrays anymore. OK, so here's an example of how to initialize a C-style array. Uh, we can initialize it with a brace enclosed list of initial values. As far as the syntax goes, first we put the type of the element that the array holds. Then we have the array name followed by square brackets. The square brackets can optionally contain the size of the array. And then after that, we have the initial values enclosed in braces. You can have an equal sign between the list of between the array name and the list of values or, or not. If we don't provide a size, then it can be inferred from the number of elements in the initializer list. If we do put a size and the number of elements of the initializer list is smaller than that size, then the remaining elements are going to be zero initialized when we're using built-in numeric types like all, in all of these examples. So for example, when we say uh, bool array three, bracket four, close bracket, false true, uh, we only give two initial values, but the size of the array is four. So uh, the, the, the third and fourth element of the array are just going to default to false. So the array is going to have false, true, false, false. And if we don't put anything in the brackets at all, then the entire array will be zero initialized. So let's look at some bad examples. So if we explicitly put the size of the array, then the number of initializers cannot be larger than that size. Okay, so this example here is an error and it's, it does not compile. If we don't provide any initializer list at all, so not even an empty one, then the memory for the array is going to be allocated, but the elements of the array are not going to be initialized. So they're just going to take on values interpreted from whatever was sitting there, there in the memory already. That means that accessing these elements results in undefined behavior. So this is something to be aware of. Uh, just like if you say int x semicolon and don't give it an initial value, it's uninitialized. The same thing with an array if you don't give it some initial values. OK, I'm also using a different kind of for loop for you to see here. So this is called a range-based for loop. This says that the from the first element of the array until the last, we copy each element into x and we print it out. So it's important to note here that x is just going to be a copy of the array element. So therefore, any change that we make to x will not affect the array itself. So that's a really important point. So let's see that more explicitly. So here I have a range-based for loop. Um, and in the body of the loop, I increment x. But again, x is just going to be a copy of the corresponding array element. So incrementing x is not going to change uh, the array element itself. So when we print out the array again, uh, it still prints out 1, 2, 3, the original values. The array elements remain unchanged. Sometimes I might want to change the elements of the array. And I can do that by taking them by reference in this range-based for loop. So now in the for loop, I say for int and x in the array. This is going to iterate over the elements of the array from beginning to the end, and in turn lets x be a reference to each element of the array. So now as x is a reference to the element of the array, a change to x will also change the array element. Okay, so now in the body of the for loop, the first for loop, when I increment x, I'm actually going to be changing the, the array element um, 
x is a reference to in that iteration. Okay, so now when I print out the elements of the array again, I'm actually going to get the values 2, 3, 4 instead of the original values 1, 2, 3. Okay, so if we actually want to change the array elements, uh, then we can, then we can uh, take them by reference in this for loop. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship between arrays and pointers. So arrays are, have a strong relationship with pointers. So basically any operation that we can do by array subscripting, we can also do via pointers. And we're gonna see examples of this now. So in fact, the name of the array itself is just a synonym for the address of the first element. So we can see this in this code snippet here. If we print out array, the, the, the variable name of the array, ARR, and if we print out the address of the first element, these are going to print out the same thing. Okay. So to talk about the relationship between arrays and pointers, we need to talk first about how arrays are laid out in memory. So elements of, a, of an array are always going to be stored contiguously in memory. So here we have a Boolean array of size three, and we use a range-based for loop to iterate over the elements of the array by reference. Okay, it's, it's, again, it's important that we're taking the elements by reference here. So we already saw that the address of a variable and the address of a reference to that variable are the same. So this uh, for loop is going to print out the address of each element of the array. So again, we would not have that behavior if we were uh, not taking the elements by reference. Um, so if we didn't have that ampersand there, bool and, if we just said bool x in the array, then we'd just be getting a copy of each array element, and that copy could have a different address than the original array element. Okay, so when we look at the output of this program, we get the addresses, the hexadecimal addresses that you see there on the right. And you see that the addresses are incremented by one each time, right? If you just look at this, the last hexadecimal digit there, it goes from D to E to F, and the rest of the digits are the same. So each Boolean takes one byte of memory. So this shows that the elements of the array are being stored in adjacent addresses. And that's what we said at the beginning, right? Elements of an array are going to be stored contiguously in memory. So let's look at the same example, but now let's use ints instead of booleans. So each int takes four bytes of memory, and now if we look at the output of this program, we see that the addresses are incremented by four each time, right? So again, just look at the last hexadecimal digit, it's going from four to eight to C. So it's being incremented by four each time. So again, these elements are being stored contiguously in memory. So let's bring that home more by looking at a picture. Um, so again, I'm just imagining our memory as a long tape, tape of cells, and each cell holds one byte. And I'm writing the addresses of the cells underneath them, and now I'm writing it to follow our, our Godbolt example. I'm writing them in hexadecimal, but I'm just abbreviating the address to the last two digits. Um, that's the only thing that, that changes in this example. Okay, so in the printout, the address of the first element of the array, uh, the last two digits of the address, are uh, E4. So E4 is the address of the first byte of the first element of the array. Okay, so and that's what we have in our picture here. Also, the, our array has ints. So in an int in our example here is, is four bytes wide. So it takes up memory addresses E4 through E7, right? The first element of the array takes up the memory address, the memory cells E4 through E7. So the next cell in memory uh, following that is E8. And indeed, that is the address of the second element of the array, right? Array of one. Uh, its address, the last two digits, uh, are E8. Okay, so in this code snippet, we define a pointer to an int called pointer to array, and we initialize it with the address of the first element of the array. And then we're going to print out pointer to array plus one. 
So again, in our picture here, uh, the initial value of pointer to array is e4, and then we're going to add one to it. So what do you think this will print out? Okay, so actually it's not going to be e5, but it's going to be e8. So in other words, pointer to array plus one is the same as the address of array of one, the, the address of the second element of the array. Okay, so you can try out this code snippet and see that for yourself. The idea is that pointers increment by the size of the type to which they point. So since pointer to array is a pointer to an int, adding one to it will actually add four to the address it stores. So here's what uh, it looks like in our picture. Uh, pointer to array points to uh, the, the first byte of array of zero. Then pointer to, pointer to array plus one is going to point to the first byte of array plus one. Pointer to array plus two is going to point to the first byte of array of two. Okay, and, and the reason why pointer arithmetic is designed this way is to make it easy to access the elements of, of an array with a pointer, right? So here's another way that we could uh, print out the elements of the array. Uh, so we just have a for loop for i goes from zero, i is at most three, we increment by i by one, uh, and we just uh, see out pointer to array plus i dereferenced, de okay? So this makes it convenient for us, right? We don't have to say pointer to array plus this, you know, the size of an int times i. That's already taken care of for us in the design of pointer arithmetic. Now I said that there's a close relationship between arrays and pointers. So an array is not identical to a pointer to its first element, but in many contexts, an array does decay to a pointer to its first element. So if we look at this uh, code snippet here, you see that array is actually behaving exactly like a pointer would. Okay, so if I say, uh, if I look at array plus i quantity and dereference that, uh, I'm getting the ith element of the array. Uh, so it's basically identical to our previous um, code snippet where we actually had a pointer to the first element of the array. So this is something that, to keep in mind that, you know, at the slightest provocation, an array is going to decay into a pointer to its first element. And another context in which you'll see that is when you pass an array to a function. Okay, then it will also decay to a pointer to its first element. So in fact, the bracket notation array of i is really just syntactic sugar for dereferencing array plus i. And you can see this in this funny example here. So just to be clear, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you would ever write code this way, but it's kind of an entertaining piece of C++ trivia. So since addition commutes, we can even print out an array like this in the loop here, where we print out I bracket array, close bracket, right? Because really this stands for dereferencing I plus array and I plus array, you know, it's the same thing as array plus I, that's just giving us the memory address of the ith element of the array. So when we, when we dereference that, we're getting the ith element of the array. So that, that this example really shows you that this bracket notation is kind of just syntactic sugar uh, for dereferencing array plus i. So that's just a, a funny little piece of C++ trivia for you.